Hello and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, uh, representing the Christian or Seeker side. And I uh, just wanted to post up the uh, one of my series on Jesus' mythicism. So uh, earlier this summer on the SNS website, I posted up part one on my series of Jesus' mythicism. And uh, part one covered uh, the category of extra biblical evidences that prove the historical Jesus actually did exist. And I focus specifically of the extra biblical sources on the category of ancient historians. Um, so there are four ancient historians that I covered. I'm going to be splitting up that part one episode into two parts, just because it's uh, quite long. So we're going to be covering uh, the ancient historians Phlegon and Thales first, and also Cornelius Tacitus in the you know uh, first part, part one A, uh, and then in the second video. Part 1b, uh, that's where I go into Suetonius and also Josephus' evidence. So, uh, yeah, that's that's what we're going to do. And then from there, it'll be brand new. I'll, I'll be making my own uh, podcast as I do the Jesus mythicism thing. So, yeah, en enjoy uh, this podcast. All right, bye-bye. All right, hello and welcome back to Skeptics and Seekers. Uh, this is going to be a solo podcast uh, of Dale's study session. We're going to be doing a new locus of study on the subject of Jesus' mythicism. So I was invited to go on the Right to Reason podcast to do a debate or a discussion on the subject of Jesus' mythicism, both with Robert Stanley and uh, another atheist podcaster named Kevin Francis, who's going to be taking up the uh, mythicist position. So yeah, I look forward to that. We're scheduled to record that for next Sunday, so hopefully that'll be up uh, sometime next week for you guys to listen to. But in the meantime, um, obviously I've been doing a lot of research into the subject of Jesus' mythicism and I figured why not do uh, an actual solo series going into great detail on all the evidence that we have for the uh, existence of the historical Jesus. So yeah, that's what this uh, series is going to be about. Uh, this is going to be part one. I'll, I'll post up parts you know, on an ad hoc basis whenever I get a chance or have the time to post something up. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to throw this uh, first part out here um, for you guys to consider uh, focusing on some of the extra biblical uh, references or secular non-Christian sources that mention Jesus. And we're going to be looking about four to five of them in this part, um, looking specifically at ancient uh, historians of the ancient Roman Empire uh, period of time there. So yeah, that's uh, we're going to be looking at Thallus and Phlegon, uh, the Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus, uh, the Roman historian Suetonius, and the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. Uh, so that's what you guys can uh, look forward to seeing. Let's, these are presented as positive evidences showing that um, a historical Jesus did in fact exist. Uh, however, uh, getting straight into it, before we actually look at the evidence itself, I think it's important to define our terms. What is it exact? What is my claim that I'm trying to prove here positively? And my positive claim is only that there a minimal historical Jesus existed historically. Um, so I'm not trying to prove that the Jesus of the Gospels and everything that he did in the Gospels is true and everything that the New Testament says. Uh, about Jesus is true or, or everything that Christians say about Jesus in later sources like with the Catholics and, and that sort of thing and their extra biblical doctrines, orthodox doctrines and that sort of thing. I, I don't care about any of that. For, for the purposes of this show, I'm taking off my Christian hat, just putting on my hat, secular historian hat, interested in truth and trying to prove that a minimal historical Jesus existed. So what do I mean by a minimal historical Jesus? Well, my definition is that there was a Jewish man named Jesus who served as the foundational basis for at least some of the later and subsequent Orthodox Christian beliefs, doctrines, and practices uh, about Jesus as outlined in the New Testament literature. Um, obviously, this is a minimal definition, so it can be expanded to include any and all details that the Christians want to affirm from the from the Gospels uh, or the New Testament as a whole being biblically inerrant. Uh, it can include Catholic, later Catholic doctrines and, and stuff like that as well. So this is just a minimal. My goal is very minimal here to establish just that there was a guy named Jesus and he served as the foundational basis for 
the Orthodox Christian beliefs, doctrines, and practices as outlined in the New Testament literature. Um, okay, so let's get straight into our first uh, part of positive evidences. As I said, we're looking at the extra-biblical, non-Christian sources that we have uh, attesting to Jesus. And uh, it's really interesting because with this, uh, some Christian apologists have mentioned, look, we, we have as many about nine, between nine to 12, and some say even as high as 18 secular non-Christian sources and evidences, which attest to the existence of this minimal historical Jesus, um, that date anywhere from between 30 AD, the time of Jesus' death, to 180 AD. So that's about a, a time frame of 150 years of the traditional date for Jesus' death. Um, all attesting that, yep, Jesus was a real guy, he's the founder of the Christian church movement, Orthodox Christian church movement, and he was, in fact, a historical figure. Uh, not only that, they go on to expound on various aspects about his life, his ministry, um, including his death and resurrection. So, this is incredible historical evidence, as, as everyone will tell you. I mean, we, we don't have this kind of evidence for most historical figures that existed, even famous ones. I mean... Yeah, pe people will try to bring up various comparisons and that sort of thing, but we'll we'll save that. That'll be another positive argument. But yeah, so these are the sources that we're looking at. These 9 to 12, uh, possibly even up to 18 secular non-Christian sources. And as I said, I'm going to be starting to look at the actual his ancient historians as a category for, uh, as the first category of these extra biblical sources. Um, and these include Greek historians, Roman historians, and uh, one Jewish historian, Josephus. Um, so there, we have about four to five of this category of extra-biblical source. And I first want to start with, uh, really it's two for the price of one, but we have Phallus and Phlegon, or Phlegon of Tralles. Um, so these were two historians who lived during the Roman Empire. They were Greek historians, so they, they wrote Hellenistic histories as opposed to Roman histories like Suetonius or, or Tacitus. So there is a difference there. Um, now with uh, Thallus, Thallus, he wrote uh, uh, what he called histories. Um, and we ha he gives us a reference to Jesus apparently in his third volume or third book. Uh, we're not sure where exactly there. And he wrote his book, according to Christian apologists, he wrote his book in about 52 to 55 AD. Um, so that's incredible. This would be the earliest source that we have uh, attesting to Jesus, even earlier than the Gospels, even earlier than um, much of Paul's letters. So yeah, that if this is true, that would be incredible evidence there. Um, and then with Phlegon, he wrote what uh, is called Chronicles. Um, he wrote about 16 books, but in book 13 or 14, again, we're not exactly sure where, um, he, again, he also talks about Jesus as well. Um, and his works are dated about 120 to 140 AD. So again, within the 180 AD time frame there. Um, so yeah, let's just quickly address who these people were. Um, so again, as I said, Thallus was a Greek uh, historian living in the Roman Empire. According to Christian apologists, he, he was actually an eyewitness or could have been an eyewitness to what he records because he uh, basically wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world uh, from the time of the Trojan War, so that's around 1200 BC, uh, until up until his own time, uh, again, uh, around 52 to 55 AD. Now, in terms of the dating, Flagan's work uh, is pretty uncontroversial in terms of its, its being dated to the mid-2nd century, uh, you know, sometime between 120 to 140 AD, with most scholars favoring the latter, the 140 AD mark. However, with Thallus, his da the dating of his work is a lot more controversial. Some scholars, in terms of when it, was, when it dates from, so we have various mentions of Thallus, um, so that about three. So one is from a guy named Julius Africanus, who we'll learn a little bit more about later on. However, in terms of dating, uh, we have two uh, other people that mention Thallus that we get this date from. So the first is from Eusebius, the early Christian church father and father of modern church history, uh, writing in the fourth century AD. 
and his name is Eusebius. So he wrote his own church history. He says this about Thales, that he wrote his history in Greek, that's Koine Greek, the common Greek, uh, and that it was a summary from the fall of Troy, 1200 BC, until the 167th Olympiad. For those that don't know, the Olympiad dating system, basically the ancient Greeks held Olympics every four years. So an Olympiad is a period of every four years since the beginning of the, the first Olympics that took place in ancient uh, Olympia in Greece. Um, so the 167th Olympiad would translate to be 112 to 109 BC. Um, no, obviously, what? Uh, well, that's a problem then. Well, if, it, if this is the work that's been attributed, uh, that we're going to be using, um, that dates before Jesus. So how can you record anything about Jesus? And in the first place, some critical scholars have, have um, come up with, oh, well, okay, well, this... Eusebius isn't talking about the same historical work. He wrote another historical work, uh, and that did go cover more up until the time of Jesus and that sort of thing. Um, but this doesn't work. Most scholars reject it. Um, he, Richard Carrier himself, he was the one who first sort of played with this and advanced this back in 1999. Uh, and then he later on realized that's complete rubbish. Uh, that's not true. Uh, it, is the, it is, in fact, the same work. Um, so again, it, we asked, well, if, if his history only covered the period up to 109 BC, how could he talk about Jesus? And what most scholars have recognized is there's a textual corruption here in the date. Um, and they'll say, well, actually, it should be, instead of 167th Olympiad, it should be the 217th Olympiad, because if you just change a couple of the Greek characters, you get 217 as opposed to 167. And that will bring us right up into the 28 to 33 AD time frame. Um, beautiful. That's that's Jesus. That's what we needed. However, Richard Carrier, I, I think, is correct in saying, yeah, but this is just speculation on, on our part. It, and there, there are other grammatical corruptions which are even easier to make, such as if it were referring to the 217th Olympiad, which is the years 89 to 92 AD. Um, or uh, he even it's even possible uh, to go as far as saying it was the 227th or 237th Olympiads, which basically put the date uh, somewhere at 100, ending in 132 AD or ending in 172 AD. And Carrier makes an argument, I'll, I'll link to his article, that these textual corruptions are actually more probable uh, mistakes to make um, than saying it dates back to the 52 um, AD or 207th Olympiad date. And I, I think he argues pretty convincingly here, at least in, in the sense that I don't think we can conclude when it was dated. So yeah, we, we have to be, in, in arguing our positive case, we have to give it to the skeptic. It could be as late as 172 AD uh, when Thallus wrote, and we can't prove it either way. And and it could be any date, really. I mean, if it's a total corruption of this date, it could be any date. Um, but yeah, I, I think the most probable options is it was a slight textual mistake or error. Um, and as such, it could be any tie. It could be the 207th Olympiad, which is 52 AD. It could also be 217th Olympiad, ending in 92 AD. Uh, or even the 227th or 237th Olympiads uh, ending in the second century, but still within our 180 AD time frame. Um, now, it's important to note that we know for a fact it does date before 180 AD because it's referenced um, in, an, in an author, author's works that is known to have been written in 180 AD. So that is the end of the line, 172 AD, based on the Olympiads, uh, is probably the most likely latest date that we have for Thales' works. Now, uh, just one thing to mention in terms of the date, um, sometimes you'll hear Christian apologists uh, say that, well, uh, Thales is actually mentioned in Josephus. And this would put, uh, you know, at least uh, at the latest, put Thales' works to be have written in the first century, 92 AD. Let's take that Olympiad instead. Uh, so sometime between 52 and 92 
AD because Josephus uh, tells us that uh, Thallus wrote. Uh, Thallus uh, existed before he wrote his histories in the antiquities of the Jews. So yeah, Josephus tells us about uh, a guy named Thallus who was a Samaritan freedman. He was freed by the emperor Tiberius and worked with him so he had access um, to all the you know resources he would have needed and that sort of thing. Uh, he was from Samaria, so that's the region in the east, um, and makes sense from where he would be a hist historian of Eastern Mediterranean or Syrian affairs. And this is this is said to prove, well, he couldn't be from the second century. He's still from the first century, even if at latest you put him around 92 AD. But the problem is, I don't think we can prove, Christians go too far in using this as evidence. It's possible, but it's we can't prove that Josephus is talking about um, Thalos uh, that we're interested here, the historian. So number one, in the first place, the word Thalos isn't anywhere in Josephus. It doesn't exist in any early extant manuscripts of Josephus um, until the uh, until a scholar really just put it in by speculation uh, or conjecture is is what the scholar says. His, his name was Hudson and it first appears in the year 1720. Um, so this this quote where jo that we're talking about is the Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, Chapter 167. Um, but yeah, the, the word thalos just isn't there. It's actually allos in the original Greek from the early manuscripts. Uh, thalos just doesn't occur until 1720, so that's problematic. Um, also, it doesn't mention anything about this Thallus um, writing a literary work or writing a history as an imperial freedman or, or anything like that. So again, again, it's and Thallus was a very common name at the time. So yeah, I, I think that Christian apologists are reading, reading things into this text and wanting to connect the two Thalluses together, but um, while it makes sense, it, it, they fit, it, it's certainly a plausible suggestion that they're one and the same. I don't think that we can meet our burden of proof in proving, yes, the Thallus, the alleged Thallus or Allos that Josephus talks about is in fact the Thallus, um, the historian that Eusebius and Julius Africanus talk about. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it in terms of the, uh, debate, the dating issue. Um, in terms of Flagan, he was also a Greek historian, wrote a Hellenistic history. Um, he was uh, he was actually a freedman. He was freed by the Emperor Hadrian uh, in the second century AD. He was from a place called Tralles. We we know about him. He he's quoted by Julius Africanus um, and and several other later Christians. Eusebius talks about him. Origin of Alexandria uh, talks about him and quotes from him as well. Um, now, Flagan was someone who, he wasn't a totally reliable historian, he got details wrong. Origen tells us that he mixed up details about Jesus and, and thought that things that Peter did uh, were things that Jesus did, uh, so he does get things wrong. Um, and he has a fondness for fantastic stories, so being from the second century, um, it wouldn't be surprising to find him copying from from Christian literature um, or, or Christian hearing secondhand testimony or hearsay and recording that in his works. Um, so yeah, that's uh, who we're talking about and when they wrote. Now the first major problem that we're going to encounter here uh, is that, well, uh, what exactly did they say? And the truth is, we don't know because their works haven't survived uh, they're totally lost in the modern world. We, we don't have any extant manuscripts or let alone the original autographs of what Thallus and Phlegon said. They're only preserved through quotations uh, of later Christian historians and authors like Eusebius or, or that sort of thing. So they, you know, that's, that's kind of a problem. We, we don't know exactly what these historians themselves said, but we only have a quote the earliest of which is preserved in a Christian, the Christian historian Julius Africanus or Sextus Julius Africanus. And that's where we get our first quote uh, from them talking about Jesus. So let's just see what Julius Africanus says here, uh, quoting them. The quote that we get from Julius Africanus can be, is um, 
quoted by Christian apologists as, as this. So, on the whole world, there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. So, in context, he, uh, Julius Africanus tells us this is within the context of uh, Jesus' resurrection, or crucifixion, sorry. Um, so, so, continuing on, this darkness, Thallus, in the third book of his history, calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate the Passover on the 14th day, according to the moon, and the passion of our Savior falls on the day before the Passover. But an eclipse of the sun takes place only when the moon comes under the sun. Uh, and it cannot happen at any other time but in the interval between the first day of the new moon and the last day of an old, of the old, that is, at their junction. How then should an eclipse be supposed to happen when the moon is almost diametrically opposite of the sun? Let opinion pass, however, let it carry the majority with it, and let this portent of the world be deemed an eclipse of the sun, like others a portent only to the eye. Um, so, so that's the part about Thallus. So he's obviously addressing, um, you know, the Matthew chapter 27, and it's also in the Synoptic Gospels, Mark and Luke, talking about at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there was this darkness uh, and an earthquake in Judea and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, he, he's trying to say, look, Tha Thallus attests to it, and he tries to explain this as an eclipse of the sun, but that's scientifically impossible. Uh, therefore, the, the implication is it must have been a supernatural portent from God. Um, so, so yeah, Julius Africanus goes on to mention Phlegon here. Phlegon records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar at full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth. Reminds me of the Gospels. Uh, manifestly, that one of which we speak. But what has an eclipse in common with an earthquake, the rending of rocks, and the resurrection of the dead, and so great a perturbation throughout the universe or the world? Surely no such event as this is recorded for a long period. Okay, so, so that's what Julius Africanus um, claimed Thallus and Phlegon said as an early church father uh, and church historian. Not only that, we also have a quote about Phlegon, not Thallus, but just Phlegon, from the early church father Origen of Alexandria, and he wrote around the same time um, against, this comes from his book Against Celsus, um, it's uh, around 248 AD, and, and Julius Africanus wrote his work, or history of the church from creation up to his time, around 220 to 221 AD. So Origen, writing about 20 years after Africanus, um, writes, quote, Quote, unquote, now Phlegon, in the 13th or 14th book, I think, of his Chronicles, not only ascribed to Jesus a knowledge of future events, uh, although falling into confusion about some things which refer to Peter as if they referred to Jesus, but also testified the result corresponded to his predictions. He referred to a description by Phlegon of an eclipse accompanied by earthquakes during the reign of Tiberius that there was the quote-unquote greatest eclipse of the sun, and that it became night in the sixth hour of the day, which is noon our time, uh, so that the stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia, and many things were overturned in Nicaea. Um, okay, so this is what we're talking about. This is, this is obviously proves that a minimal historical Jesus existed. It also confirms uh, that certain gospel events in the synoptic gospels such as the darkness uh the rising of the dead uh you know those rising of the saints and earthquakes that re rended the rocks uh, or split the rocks and that sort of thing all happened uh, and this is what we get from thallus and phlegon through the quotations of julius africanus and origin of alexandria uh, and later on eusebius also quotes them as we'll find out um, so let's um, focus now. So since our earliest source that quotes these guys is uh, Julius Africanus, uh, you know, a later Christian writing in about 220, 221 AD, what do we know about Julius Africanus? Is he a reliable Christian historian? Obviously he was Christian, so he would have bias. Um, what are some things that we can know about this guy to, to determine if he's reliable? Well, in the first place, just general information, he was a native of Jerusalem. 
um, he socialized with people, King Abgar IV of Edessa. Now, if, uh, you'll remember from the Shroud series, the King of Edessa was the first king in human history to convert to Christianity official and have the official religion of his, of his city be Christianity. Um, also, uh, Julius Africanus, he traveled widely. He visited Ararat, for example, in search of Noah's Ark. He visited the Dead Sea uh, and Jacob's Terebinth in Palestine. He traveled to Rome as an official embassy from Amos. Um, and at Rome, as part of this embassy, he so impressed the Emperor Alexander Severus that he was entrusted by the Emperor to set up the building of a public library at the Pantheon in Rome. And this is pre-Constantine, guys. This is a pagan emperor being so impressed with a Christian. So this is something of note. Um, he wrote several works, uh, similar in content to Pliny's Natural History. Uh, they were dedicated to the emperor, of course. He did work in textual criticism um, of, of Greek works and Christian works, uh, including Homer, Homer's uh, writings and that sort of thing. Now, What's incredible is he was the first Christian in history to develop modern textual criticism. Uh, he employed some methods that modern textual critics uh, use today. Um, uh, also, so he, he used uh, evaluated manuscripts. He knew about various civic libraries on the old site of Jerusalem. Uh, what, what's important here, Africanus was the first Christian in all of history whose writings were not all concerned with his own Christian faith. Um, he was not, you know, unlike Origen, not, he, he wasn't first and foremost an ecclesiastic teacher. Um, he was a philosopher. He pursued his favorite studies um, and, and wrote histories, um, not just uh, histories regarding the faith, but also what he called, quote unquote, profane history as well. Um, you know, later Christian historians were so impressed with this guy, they, they used him as their model in coming up with different methods of doing ancient and even later medieval historiography was based on his work and his different methods uh, of, of doing history. You know, the later Christian historian Eusebius was greatly influenced by this guy and, and Eusebius is the father of modern church history. Um, he was also known, he was a student alongside Clement and Origen of Alexandria. Yeah, th this guy was scrupulously honest in his uh, critique of both pagan and Christians. Uh, he's famous for getting into a massive dispute with Origen of Alexandria on the history, historicity of the Book of Susanna, uh, which is um, an apocryphal book added on to the Book of Daniel. Uh, Catholics and, and Greek Orthodox, I think, uh, accept it. But yeah, he, he got into a dispute and proved through textual criticism, basically saying it was written in Greek and was not a part of the original Aramaic. So he provided that argument against Christians. He doesn't just blindly follow tradition because he's a Christian. So yeah, uh, just as a modern, Dr. Robin Lane Fox is someone who's uh, looked at a lot into Julius Africanus as a secular scholar and historian. Uh, today, and he cites him as the best educated dual culture products of his day, the best. Um, so, so yeah, this, I think when it comes to the question of was Julius qualified as an ancient historian, you're darn tootin' he was. I mean, number one, he has the background to lead us believe that he has the requisite skills, resources, and access to information to do the history. Uh, as I said, he traveled widely. He was a favorite of the emperor, giving him access to rare and privileged info. He built an imperial library in Rome, uh, giving him access to the sources and materials he needed. He had skills in textual criticism before anybody else did. Uh, he employed semi-scientific approaches, so multiple approaches to doing history. I think he was qualified to be uh, an ancient historian. And... Secondly, subsequent historians uh, all used him, as I said. But yeah, we, we have several examples where he demonstrates his methodology is reliable as a historian. Okay, so, so this leads into a, a quick discussion of the problems, just, just based on the, the ancient evidence alone here. Um, so in the first place, with respect, let, let's pretend Julius Africanus, he, since he's reliable, he did get, quote, Thallus and Flavin correctly. Um, again, we don't have their writings, so we don't know if uh, Julius Africanus is 
doing any editing or connecting any dots, which was common ancient historiographical practice back then. Does Thallus himself talk about Jesus? Um, does, Flag does Flagan mention Jesus? Um, and with Flagan, I think we can say that he did because we have multiple sources saying that he linked it to Jesus and he's in the second century and, and would have been interested in that sort of thing. But with Thallus especially, we just have no idea what he said. Um, and in fact, it seems that the evidence points to the fact that he, he didn't link or talk about Jesus at all. Um, it, it seems like what's going on is he mostly just talked about an earthquake uh, as well that happened in Bithynia because Eusebius also quotes the same thing. And he was familiar with Julius Africanus and Thallus. He, taught, he explicitly says he uses Thallus, his works, which weren't lost at that time as a source. And he never talks about, he never gives this quote that we get from Africanus. Instead, he just talks about Thallus uh, mentioning about earthquakes in Bithynia, which is Turkey, not Judea. Um, and, you know, the rocks being split in that region and that sort of thing. And, and an eclipse of the sun, which he doesn't give a location for. Um, now, the only coincidence is that, well, this just happens to occur in the time, same time uh, that Jesus was crucified in the reign of Tiberius. So, yeah, it, it's hard to, we can't prove whether they themselves talk about a historical Jesus as opposed to just these random events and Julius Africanus or later Christians connect the dots and say, oh, this, this, is the, this is the eclipse that the Gospels are talking about. Look, Thallus is talking about it. Um, he's talking about Jesus' crucifixion and that sort of thing. Uh, or if Thallus himself actually links these events to the crucifixion of Jesus and therefore talks about a historical Jesus. Yeah, I, I personally just, I, even Gary Habermas, I've got a, mentions that this is a good point. Um, when he's talking about a mythicist, G.A. Wells, he says this, quote unquote, but Wells raises a fair question about this testimony. Julius Africanus only implies that Thallus linked the darkness to Jesus' crucifixion. But we are not specifically and explicitly told if Jesus is mentioned in Thallus' original history at all. Um, so this is obviously a, a problem that kind of eliminates Thallus's testimony as being important right there, um, or a proof that hit the historical Jesus existed on a balance of probabilities. I don't think we can use it. Um, Flagon's a different story because we have Origen and other Christians that do, including Eusebius, that had other independent works and did say that he talked about Jesus. Uh, so I think it's more probable than not that Phlegon did talk about, did link this uh, earthquake at the time to Jesus. However, again, the, the problem is with the quotes we get from Origen and from Eusebius is that these events don't take place in Judea. Uh, they take place in Bithynia or Turkey. So it, it looks like later Christians have sort of mangled that up uh, in addition through Africanus and that sort of thing and, and linked these together. So so yeah, these are the problems. Even taking it, things at face value, Africanus was, was quoting these guys properly and that sort of thing. Uh, it does seem like Julius Africanus and or possibly someone later linked Jesus' crucifixion to these events that the ancient world, Greek historians themselves did not. Um, so now another problem that comes up uh, here for interpretation is, is based on the text. Julius Africanus's works, we don't even know what he necessarily said because we don't have his, either the original autographs or even later manuscripts of his works that are extant today. So we don't even know what Julius Africanus said. Uh, we only have his works preserved to us uh, through a guy named George Sincellus. Uh, and he was writing in the around eight, eight, uh, 870 to 875 AD. He wrote a, a comprehensive history of the world where he adopted all the pagan historians and all the Christian historians and kind of made a universal history up to his day in the, in the 9th century AD. So in terms of textual transmission or the bibliographical text test, Obviously, that allows for a lot of corruption in the text. And in fact, we, we actually know that there, the quote that I gave is actually proven corrupted in terms of Flagon. 
Oz quote that wasn't original to Julius Africanus, and it it wasn't even pro probably wasn't even original to George Sincellus. It This was a textual corruption that came into uh, effect in the 10th century and even and expanded in the 12th century. A guy named Michael he wrote copied George Sincellus and that sort of thing and um, copied these quotes. And there's there's expansion going on that even George Sincellus himself didn't talk about not again that the this will be mentioned in the sources so check out the sources i've got the textual transmission in detail from richard carrier and, and a scholar named jacoby and that sort of thing so yeah one, once again there are pro there are problems in the textual transmission uh, and we just don't have access to the to the manuscripts of the primary sources even in terms of the primary source julius africanus if you want to consider him. Um, that said, we, we do have the primary manu manuscript copies of Eusebius and Origins works that mention this. Um, so yeah, in terms of this, what worth do I give this? It, just based on these problems alone, I don't think that we can say the we have proof from secular Greek hist historians during the Roman Empire that attest to Jesus through the eclipse and that sort of thing. My honest impression is that this fails as evidence and that what happened is Phlegon in the second century uh, and other historians, poss possibly Thallus, did talk about an eclipse uh, of the sun that took place during the time of Jesus' crucifixion and a massive earthquake which rent rocks and that sort of thing in Bethania, Turkey, uh, not necessarily in Judea. Um, that's a later textual uh, thing that happened in the medieval period and that's that's pretty much it and and possibly Julius Africanus uh, linked this to Jesus or other Christian authors linked this to Jesus possibly Flagan himself linked it to Jesus um, through hearing about the gospel stories or, or secondhand testimony or third-hand testimony or something like that um, it's unlikely Flagan would have gotten it from Christians because he got details so wrong about Peter and that sort of thing um, and mixing up Peter for Jesus. So he's probably hearing it third hand from a pagan uh, or something like that, you know, street testimony, what they heard Christians saying. Yeah, I, I think in in total, we just have, in summarization, we just have to say that this evidence has too many holes. And I'm not even going into some of the other problems that came up. I'm trying to keep it simple. Uh, that this, this evidence is possible, um, but it, it's... It's not proven on a balance of probabilities. And since I bear the burden of proof, I can't use Thallus or Flagon's quote in Julius Africanus and Origen as proof that a historical, minimal historical Jesus did in fact exist. Okay, so let's move on to our next uh, extra biblical non Christian uh, source from the ancient historian category. And this is uh, one of the most famous ancient Roman historians that that uh, Christian apologists like to use to prove that uh, minimal historical Jesus did in fact exist. And that is, of course, the writings from Cornelius Tacitus. Um, so who is Cornelius Tacitus? Um, well, he was uh, he's known as the greatest ancient Roman historian. So he wrote a Roman history rather than a Hellenistic history. Um, he, he wrote a multi -vol multiple volume work uh, detailing the history uh, called the Annals or Annals, um, and this was written approximately 115 to 117 AD. Um, so uh, yeah, that's sort of the three year range. He, he died in the year 120 AD, so he it wouldn't have been uh, written after that date. Uh, and he was born in around 52 to 55 AD, so obviously he would not be an eyewitness to Jesus or that sort of thing. Um, yeah, he, he wrote his multi-volume work around 115, 117 AD, towards the end of his life. He called these the histories or the annals. Uh, it covered the period for the annals, and that's that's the book that we're interested in for, you know, the proving the historical Jesus. Uh, so that covered the period from the first Roman Emperor Augustus, uh, his death in around 14 AD, up until the death of Nero in 68 AD. And then his histories covers the period after Nero's death, 
uh, until the death of Dom the Emperor Domitian in 96 AD. So it's, it's obviously the annals that we're interested in for proving a historical Jesus that, that covered the period when Jesus was alive. Now, unlike the other uh, Thallus and Phlegon, the great news is with Tacitus, his works, his primary works, have survived through extant manuscripts. Um, so we do have his actually primary literature that we can consult. Uh, we don't have to worry about preserving him through later Christians quoting his work uh, or, you know, get into textual issues that way. No, we, we actually have manuscript copies uh, of his work, primary literature. However, frustratingly, as with all ancient manuscripts, uh, much of his work has been lost, though. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we this includes the writings that cover the period from 29 AD to 33 AD when Jesus would have been crucified and, you know, the trial of Jesus where it would have been recorded there. These haven't survived. So, you know, darn it, that would have been the, the best if we had that for proof that a historical Jesus existed. But uh, that's, yeah, um, that said it's lost. So we, we don't have that. But we do actually have one uh, quote from Cornelius Tacitus, which does reference Jesus and is relevant for proving a uh, historical Jesus existed, according to Christian apologists. Uh, so this comes from Annals, Book 15, uh, 44, Chapter 44, where Tacitus mentions both Jesus and uh, Christians uh, during the reign of the Emperor Nero. Um, so he's talking about a time back in 64 AD after there was this great fire of Rome and it destroyed uh, about three quarters. Some some say as high as half the city, up to three quarters of uh, of Rome was completely destroyed and went up in flames. And people were looking at Nero and blaming him and saying he did this on purpose because he wanted to build his palace and you know he had his great pleasure lake and that sort of thing, which um, was subsequently destroyed by the Emperor Vespasian, and that's where we have the Colosseum today. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so what did Nero do in regards to this? He, he said, no, 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 it wasn't me. It was those Christians. And he started persecuting Christians quite satanically, I would say. Um, uh, you know, he was known as the Antichrist for crying out loud, uh, at the time. So, yeah. Oh, uh, so what is, what does Cornelius Tacitus say about Jesus and Christians in this context, uh, the context of talking about the Emperor Nero placing the blame and using Christians as scapegoats uh, after 64 AD, after the great fire of Rome. So here's what he says, quote unquote, but not all the relief that could come from man, not all the bounties that the prince could bestow, nor all the atonements which could be presented to the gods availed to relieve the Emperor Nero from the infamy of being believed to have ordered the conflagration, the conflagration, the fire of Rome, the great fire of Rome. I don't know why I can't say the confla... <laughs> um, the great fire of Rome, we'll leave it at that. Um, now, continue on. Hence, to suppress the rumor, Nero falsely charged with guilt and punished innocent Christians who were hated for their enormities by the populace. Christus, uh, spelled properly, Christ us, the founder of the name was put to death by Pontius Pilate, the procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition repressed for a time broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty upon their information. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city, uh, as for the hatred against, as for their hatred against mankind. So that, that's the quote. Uh, it's a nice, quick and easy single quote. This is actually preserved. So in Cornelius Tacitus's own writings in manuscript form, um, so yeah, this looks like it's great evidence. This proves that there was a historical Jesus uh, who was killed and put to death by Pontius Pilate. Gospels confirmed. During the reign of Tiberius, Gospels confirmed. The Christian belief is said to have sprung up in Judea. It was suppressed for a little bit and then it broke out again all over the world, including in the city of Rome itself. Gospels and Acts confirmed. 
Um, so yeah, this looks like great evidence on the face of it. Now, there is one caveat that I just want to mention that was an objection brought up uh, from my skeptical co-host, David Johnson, when I was going over the evidence with him. So in the first place, uh, another aspect here is uh, confirming the Gospels is that Christ Christus was the founder of the Christian movement. Um, great Gospels confirmed. Uh, but my skeptical co-host David Johnson brings up the fact, yeah, but look, it it's, uses the name Christus. It doesn't use, there's no mention of a Jesus there. And remember, you're trying to prove the minimal historical Jesus. There's no Jesus. Um, so, yes, in, in the first place, it's true. He doesn't mention the name, the proper name, Jesus. And it wouldn't have made sense for, for him to do that. And we'll, we'll get into, that's sort of an objection that I'll get into in a, in a bit. But I just want to say, for the sake of argument's sake, it's totally irrelevant against mythicists. I mean, who cares that whether you get the name or not, uh, I can get the name Jesus as part of a cumulative case because we know that the Christians said their founder was Jesus Christ and that sort of thing. So when you bring in supplement, supplemental evidences from the Christians or other uh, pagan and, and Jewish sources, then you can find out this Christus was named Jesus and he was the founder of the early Christian church movement. Um, but it's it's enough against the mythicist, even if we don't get Jesus' name from Cornelius Tacitus in isolation, we still get a historical person who is known as Christus, who founded the Christian movement and was executed historically by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. Um, so I don't even care if you'll give me a name. This disproves and destroys the mythicist uh, and falsifies it, if true. Um, if it is, in fact, a good quote, good evidence, um, yeah, this proves that there was a historical guy who founded all of the Christians and was the, the basis. And we can find out whether his name was Bob or Jesus from, from other sources and a, a cumulative case. But yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that aspect that uh, my skeptical co-host brought up, and he's right. It doesn't mention the name Jesus. It calls him Christus. Totally irrelevant, though. It's, it's, it still destroys mythicism. Um, and the idea of mythicists and that sort of thing. So, yeah, let's let's first uh, start the other way, the opposite way around from the the way I try, I approach Thallus and Phlegon. Let let's look at the textual history and do a textual analysis of Tacitus's writings of, of this the annals. So, in the first place, today, pretty much no one with a functioning brain, uh, whether mythicist or or conservative, fundamental, Baptist, uh, Christian, nobody denies that Cornelius Tacitus actually wrote the annals as a whole. You know, no one claims it's a forgery. You're, you're laughed at and looked upon as ridiculous if you even suggest such a thing. But this wasn't always the case. There there were some radical skeptics in the, the 18th century, starting around 1775 AD, up until the 19th century, who did actually try to argue, no, the, the entirety of Tacitus, that's all a Christian forgery pretending to be Tacitus. And according to a uh, Tacitine scholar, Dr. C.W. Mendel, one of the world's experts in Tacitus, since the year 1775, there have been at least six attempts to discredit the works of Tacitus um, as complete forgeries. So, yeah, the, these include, I guess, the, fir the first attempt was originated with Voltaire, the atheist, radical atheist. And yeah, they, they took, you know, various positions. John Wilson, uh, back in 1878, uh, came up with uh, an idea that all the works were forged uh, starting in the 15th century and that sort of thing. In 1890, uh, there was another one. Um, even as late as 1920, a guy named Leo Wiener uh, he was the last guy uh, to come up with this. He, he wrote his book, Tacitus, Germania and Other Forgeries. Um, and his, his last attempt was sort of in vain to prove by a, a really a bewildering display of linguistic fireworks that the Germania, um, and by implication, the other works of Tacitus, including the, the um, annals, were, were all forgeries made after Arabic influence. Uh, had extended into Europe. But yeah, suffice to say, everyone with the PhD today laughs at these guys and says uh, they're wrong and they're they're ridiculous. In the first place, the, the reason for this is most of these people were living, were basically ignorant. Um, you know, they lived at a time where we didn't have the same evidence that modern scholars do. 
Um, so there, there was a bit of a gap in the, around the 1400s, like, um, whereby a guy named Poggio Bracciolone, um, and they try to say it in the 1400s, there is this brand new thing that came about, um, this Tacitus, uh, which is a Christian forgery, was written around this time. And that, that's what a lot of these um, radical skeptics about Tacitus as a whole try to argue for. Um, but it's, it's scientifically proven, or rather archaeologically proven, that that is wrong. And this is why everyone laughs at these guys, because they just don't know what they're talking about. Um, so, you know, we, we also have quotes uh, from people dating back to the 400s AD, ta- quoting the Tacitus works exactly as we have it uh, today. So, you know, we, we have Sulpicius Severus of Aquitaine, and he actually quotes the specific passage 1544, uh, as well as other passages, 1537 and that sort of thing, that we're interested in. Um, but there's others as well that quote other parts of Tacitus's history. Uh, we have manuscripts that predate, so it's archaeologically proven that it, it this version of Tacitus as a whole that we have did not just come about in the 1400s. It, it predates that by centuries, going back to the ancient world, and this is proven. You can see it with your own eyeballs, and I'll, I'll provide a source detailing all the manuscripts that we have uh, as well. There's there's links you can see it with your own eyes if you can read other languages. Um, and yeah, as I said, it, it we have quotes of Tacitus exactly like what we have um, as far back as the 400s AD, um, including the specific passage 1544 that talks about Jesus. So um, yeah, this is just complete rubbish, and, and it's wrong. Um, A second major reason why people laugh at these guys is because it's absurd. What motivation? A Christian would have no motivation to forge a writing of Tacitus. Just, you know, all of the writings that we have extant today in the year 1427 to, you know, basically it's very... Tacitus hates Christians and he hates Jews, and this is obvious in his writings. It's very anti-Christian. No Christian would write that. They would have no motivation for writing that just to get one quote out of everything else that's so not relevant for a Christian to care about. It's just pagan secular history. So yeah, there, there's no motivation on this on this front as well. It just doesn't make sense that a, a Christian uh, would say this. So according to Dr. Mendel, the Tacitian scholar and world's expert uh, that I mentioned before, here's what he says. According to Mendel, quote unquote, None of these writers uh, or radical skeptics have won general acceptance of their estimates of Tacitus. The extreme positions have been completely abandoned since the 1920s, and the general integrity of Tacitus has been archaeologically and historically vindicated. Um, so, And it's from Mendel that I get, uh, get a list of all the people and archaeological proof that proves Tacitus's writings definitely go back in the form that we have to the ancient world. Um, so, so yeah, Tacitus as a, as a whole has been vindicated. But as I said, what what about uh, a more nuanced claim? And this is again rare, but there are some. I think Bob Price might do this. I'm not sure. I need to recheck that. But okay, well maybe Tacitus in general is is vindicated. And yep, Tacitus wrote the Annals on history and that sort of thing. But the specific text that talks about Jesus that was a later Christian interpolation or forgery that specific text. Um, So what can we say against that? Um, Well, in the first place, uh, it would have to be a very ancient forgery, right? Because we have quotes going back to the 400s AD uh, for this specific text that talks about Jesus. So it's very, it would have to be an ancient forgery that's scientifically or archaeologically proven, 100%. However, in terms of an ancient interpolation, that's also improbable. And most Tacitian scholars all agree with me about this. They, they don't uh, think that this is a Christian interpolation. They say that's improbable. And they give the following reason. So, so number one, in the first place, this specific 1544 text appears in every single known manuscript copy of the Annals. There are, there are none that uh, don't have this text. And that's one of the tests people look for to find out if there was an interpolation or textual corruption in the text. Um, Although with this, we have to admit and be fair to the mythicists that we have very few copies of Tacitus. And 
none of those manuscript copies date earlier than the 11th century. Um, so that's very late. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's just the nature of ancient history. Unfortunately, you, you know, everything dates from the 9th century to the medieval period sometime. However, also we have Tacitine experts like Dr. Henry Furneaux, and they've conclusively proven that this passage is in perfect Tacitian style, so that this is a linguistic argument. It's written in what's called, quote-unquote, Tacitian Latin. Um, so Tacitus has his own unique style. And, and in fact, uh, Christians in the uh, 15th century and 16th century reading Tacitus, this was one of the things they critiqued him on and said, oh, man, Tacitus sucks. He, he, he writes bad Latin. In, in addition for his... Um, anti-Christian bias. They also condemned him for writing bad Latin, uh, as they called it. Obviously, it wasn't bad at his time, but for them, they considered it undeveloped or primitive Latin. And all scholars, every single one, there are zero today that um, disagree with this. It's universally accepted, including by mythicists Richard Carrier, G.A. Wells, all admit this. It's, it's conclusive. Tacitus wrote 1544. Uh, as well as his book, The Annals as a Whole. Um, so, yeah, this another thing here is that the anti-Christian tone or bias in this particular passage is so strong, it's extremely unlikely. There's no motivation that a later Christian would have written this at all. And as I said to you, I, the Tacitian polemic against Christians is so strong that this was one of the two factors that Tacitus was condemned by Christians in the 16th century. They, they, he got his bad Latin, uh, and he was an anti-Christian bigot. Um, so they, there's no motivation for a Christian, later Christian to interpolate this passage at all. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and that's why the majority of Tacitian scholars, the world's experts that specialize in actual, actually studying Tacitus, not Bible scholars, not biased mythicists, uh, people with actual PhDs and who study the writings of Tacitus for their entire life's work all agree with me and say this text is not corrupted. It's perfect and it was written by Tacitus. Yeah, and obviously Jewish people wouldn't have interpolated it. They wouldn't have been in, a, in the position to insert this into medieval manuscripts in the 11th century or even in the ancient world. They never had power during the diaspora and that sort of thing. So that doesn't make sense. They didn't have an opportunity to do it. And pagans in the ancient world, why would they interpolate something about Jesus? They would have no motivation about it. So yeah, it, it's confirmed. This text was written by Tacitus in 115 to 117 AD. Um, there are no textual issues. Um, and most scholars, including mythicists, admit, yep, Tacitus wrote this. Now, there are some lay skeptics that I, I should mention here uh, who try to provide a counter to this. No one who's an actual scholar. Um, again, I'm, I'm not 100% about Bob Price, but I, I don't think he questions this either. I, I need to double check that. But, you know, some skept lay skeptics will advocate for an interpolation here and will say, well, look, no ancient early Christian church father quotes this passage in early church history. So this proves it must have been added later, because why would they pass up on quoting something about Jesus? They, they quoted Phlegon, um, they quoted Phallus, remember? But yeah, to, to counter this, look, no church father uh, would have willingly quoted such a negative reference to Jesus. They, this just proves that they didn't have the motivation not only to interpolate such a passage, but they didn't even want to quote it because it was so negative and polemical against Christianity and against Jesus. Also, Tacitus, we have to remember, he was an elite, an intellectual elite of his day. He wrote for a very limited uh, number of his peers, audience, you know, a very limited audience, people of his peers. Um, so the, the annals may not have gotten into the church's hands at an early date. It probably took you know, at least a couple centuries, once Christians started coming into into more power, then they would have had access and started quoting this at, or that sort of thing. But the early Christians, um, they wouldn't have been able to get their hands on an, on the annals in the same way they might have been able to get their hands on Phlegon or, you know, another Greek historian Thallus's writings or, or that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think that the, ta the text has been proven historically to have been written by Tacitus in general. And this specific passage is not an interpolation or forgery. It was written by the hand of Tacitus himself. 
Um, so yeah, given, okay, great. So given that it's written by Cornelius Tacitus, does that prove that a historical Jesus actually did exist? What, what is the reliability of Cornelius Tacitus and or his sources? And, and let's, let's look at that and see what some objections might be in that sort of thing. So let's first start with Cor uh, Cornelius Tacitus himself. Uh, his reliability or bias and that sort of thing. So in the first place, Tacitus as a Roman historian has been called the greatest, the best, absolute top-notch historian of ancient Rome by basically all modern scholars and historians. He, he's praised today for his moral integrity and essential goodness. And the Tacitian literature, again, scholars that actually study, these are Tacitian scholars, secular Tacitian scholars that study Tacitus and only Tacitus 365 days a year or something. That's an exaggeration, but uh, this is what they this is what they specialize in, and they're full of praise for the accuracy, care, uh, critical capability, um, and just general trustworthiness of uh, Tacitus and his works. So um, I've compiled a list of about nine Tacitian scholars, secular Tacitian non-Christian, they're not Bible scholars, they're not Christian apologists, these are Tacitian scholars who all back me up in saying that Tacitus, my goodness, this guy is where it's at. He's a reliable historian. You can trust what this guy says in general in, in accordance with the ancient historiographical method. So in the first place I have a quote from Dr. Ronald Syme from Oxford. Um, he's regarded as one of the foremost Tacitian scholars in the world. And he says this, quote unquote, the prime quality of Cornelius Tacitus is distrust. He was no stranger to industrious investigation and his diligence of investigating matters was exemplary. Another Tacitian scholar, Dr. Ronald H. Martin, he mentions this, quote unquote, it is clear then that Tacitus read widely and that the idea that he was an uncritical follower of a single source or hearsay is quite untenable. Um, we also have Dr. Michael Grant, you know, responding to, in context, he was responding to someone saying Tacitus was biased and showed an unfair selectivity and that sort of thing. He, he says, so sure, all ancient historians did utilize selective measures in the material they presented. However, Tacitus was, quote unquote, careful to contrast what had been handed down orally with the literary with literary tradition there is no doubt zero doubt that tacitus took a great deal of care in selecting his material um, another scholar doc tacitian scholar dr ronald meller says quote unquote tacitus does not slavishly follow as some of his roman predecessors did the vagaries of his sources, and if research is the consultation and evaluate uh, is the consultation and evaluation of sources, there can be little doubt that Tacitus engaged in serious research. Though it is not often apparent in the smooth flow of his narrative, Tacitus consulted both obscure and obvious sources, and he distinguishes always um, unexceptionally distinguishes fact from rumor with a scrupul scrupulicity uh, that is rare in ancient historians. Um, here's another one. Dr. Kenneth Wellesley uh, says, quote unquote, very seldom does Tacitus show, uh, show to be false to fact, and archaeology has shown that only once or twice is Tacitus found to be guilty of a small slip. This is incredible. Uh, I'll leave you with one last one. Another Tacitian, secular Tacitian scholar, Dr. Arnaldo Mamagliano. And he says, look, Tacitus was, quote unquote, not a, not a researcher in the modern sense, of course. He nevertheless says that he was a writer whose reliability cannot be seriously questioned. Um, so Arnaldo says that he's uh, a writer whose reliability cannot be seriously questioned. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, this is incredible. This proves uh, Tacitus is someone that you should just believe. Uh, he gets the benefit of the doubt when he reports facts. He's always, with the exception of one or two minor exceptions, always proven to be accurate in what he reports. 
but there are there have been some skeptical counters to this. So it's obvious that Tacitus was an ancient historian. As great as he is, he's never going to be up to the standards of a modern historian with modern historiography. And as such, Tacitus had an obvious bias. Um, he's a biased ancient historian, and he manipulated his data. He, he did use ancient historiographical techniques. He used selection techniques of his data and what was important for him to make to make points right that um as we said um you know craig keener told us ancient historians uh used history to provide edifying points not just report historical data um so dr ronald meller the tacitian scholar that i mentioned before he notes that tacitus uh, had special contempt for the lower classes, and he had a strong bias against Eastern religions, including Judaism and Christianity, as we already mentioned. Um, and sometimes this got the, the better of his judgment. It caused him to think they were unworthy of curiosity and research at times. He sometimes would accept a hodgepodge of truth and falsehood with little critical analysis on uh, anti-Semitic cliches um, at times. So, uh, yeah, I that's sort of the first objection. Look, Tacitus, as great as he is, he's not hes not perfect. He's not a modern historian. So how would we respond to this? So first of all, we, we note that all recorded history, both ancient and modern, is biased and manipulated history. And that modern historians have to select what's important to report on. So just because that there's an evident bias um, in the Jesus passage, specifically an anti-Christian bias, uh, that doesn't mean that Tacitus isn't still trustworthy in both in general and in this particular passage. Secondly, look, there's no indication that Tacitus' bias had any effect on the Jesus reference. Um, I mean, if it would have had any influence, it would be the opposite of the sort required in order to devalue the reference. Even Meller, Dr. Meller, admits there is no evidence that Tacitus invented or suppressed the facts in this regard. He did not, quote-unquote, change his details to fit his reconstruction of the past, but rather engaged in selective interpretation, as indeed all, do all historical writers. Um, another Tacitian scholar is Dr. Benario. He likewise observes, look, bias is an inevitable part of any ancient historical work. He notes Tacitus' bias against the Emperor Tiberius, um, but even in these places, Tacitus has been proven to be reliable and is not intentionally fraudulent. He finishes off, as I said, with Tacitus presents an almost invariably accurate report, having been confirmed by both archaeology, epigraphical evidence, and other historical authors. Uh, Dr. Grant, another Tacitian scholar, similarly records Tacitus' interpretation of the facts, whether unconsciously or through deliberate fervor, fervid intention, is often invidious, invidious. But the actual facts which he records are generally accurate. So, yeah, yes, Tacitus had his biases, and his biases were overt. He didn't hide them. You know, ancient historians didn't have a problem being explicit with their bias. Um, but still, Tacitus has proven, despite his bias, it doesn't affect the general accuracy or reliability of the facts that he is reporting on, including the facts uh, about Jesus that we're talking about here. Another, a second skeptical uh, objection against Cornelius Tacitus's uh, thing is, um, you know, specifically related to, okay, Tacitus's focus and emphasis is not on Christians. Remember, I, I quoted Meller above. Uh, talking about how he hated uh, Christians, he hated Eastern religions and Jews, he thought they were a bunch of nutballs, and uh, sometimes this caused him to be a bit careless in reporting, you know, anti-Semitic slurs and stuff like that. You know, uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Wilkins says this, look, Christianity is not a part of Tacitus's history, except for the one reference in the Annals. He shows no interest in the new movement, uh, when he when he does advert to Christians in the book, it is not because he is interested in Christianity as such, or aimed to inform his readers about the new religion, as for example he he did in a lengthy discussion in another work, the histories, but because he wished to make a point about the extent of Nero's vanity and the magnitude of his vices, and to display the crimes he committed against the Roman people. So to respond to this objection, I th I think it has to be admitted. Um, 
look, yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. Tacitus was not interested in reporting details about Christianity. He could give two figs about it, um, just like he cared less about any Jews or Eastern religions in general. He, he viewed them with contempt. Uh, so that this wasn't an emphasis. The only reason he even mentions Christian seers is because he wants to defame Nero. Um, so, so Robert Wilkin is correct, but that doesn't mean that Tacitus would have done sloppy work or reported uncritically, reported inaccurate details about Jesus. Because in the first place, we've already seen Tacitus' general character is he, he doesn't do this. Uh, he's very critical with his sources. Even we have one case where he doesn't even believe his friends, uh, Pliny the Younger or Pliny Secundus in the Latin, Pliny the Second, was uh, giving him information and he, he just wouldn't accept it uncritically. He said, this is complete rubbish. Uh, I mean, you're full of it. You need to check your brain or something, is what he told his own best buddy, Pliny, Pliny Secundus. Um, so in general, this is improbable. Tacitus wouldn't have just taken information about this, even when he doesn't care about the people that he's investigating. It's, it's improbable that that would happen, even if there are a few exceptions where he reports slurs uncritically against Jews or Eastern religions or that sort of thing. Secondly, when it comes to Jesus specifically, we can prove that Tacitus and Christianity, Tacitus would actually have a special interest to investigate the origins of Christianity specifically. Um, so the first comes from the fact that um, there was a likely a cause for investigation because uh, right in Tacitus's own backyard, uh, in 95 AD in Rome, the Emperor Domitian, uh, his niece Domitella, and her husband Flavius Clemens were actually accused of quote unquote atheism related to quote unquote being a carried away being carried away into Jewish customs. And by Jewish customs here, this is a, a an idiom meaning Christianity. It's not Judaism uh, that they're talking about here in the context of, of the quote. Uh, and that's that's uncontroversial. Everyone admits that. Um, you know, I've got a scholar here, Dr. Bank, who says, look, Jewish custom referred to here is Christianity. That's uh, undisputable uh, from the context of, of what they're talking about. So this would have given Tacitus a perfect motive to investigate this movement historically. It's affecting the emperor's family uh, relate, uh, and relatives. Um, so this, this would have spurred him to kind of look into what is this stuff all about. Um, also, secondly, Tacitus has a unique special interest in what he calls, quote-unquote, pretenders. So Jesus would have been a pretender, a king of the Jews, a, the Messiah. And Tacitus has sort of a, a special interest in looking into pretenders in general. Uh, especially pretenders who claim to have been risen from the dead. This is just his quirk. It, it's a quirk of his nature. This is what he likes to look into. Um, so this, these are two reasons that would have given Tacitus in particular special reason to investigate the origins of Christianity, in particular Jesus, to find out what, what, it's, what it's all about. Yeah, I, obviously since Tacitus is too good a historian not to look into the origin of a cult, especially one that is directly relevant to him and is impacting on the emperor's family. And the fact that Tacitus has this special interest in what he calls quote unquote pretenders. Yeah, I think this lifts it out of the category. This isn't just, you know, Tacitus reporting uh, the latest insult against Jews or Eastern religions as being a bunch of maniacs and idiots uh, or whatever insult that was going around at the time. Uh, no, this relates to something he's actually interested in, something that's affecting the emperor's family, and that he himself has a quirky interest in, because it involves a pretender, someone who pretended to be risen from the dead, so he would want to look into it. Um, so yeah, that, that's how we would answer that objection. Another objection related to Tacitus' general reliability, basically the, the Tacitian scholar Dr. Ronald Meller that I mentioned before, he notes that Tacitus occasionally reported stories which were in fact false historically, but were only true in a literary sense or a moral sense. So remember, he's, he's in tune with ancient historiographical practice there. And he also, as we said with the anti-Jewish Semitic slurs, he also recorded, report, occasionally reported a rumor or a report that he knew was false. 
Um, so Meller gives this example. Look, when reporting Augustus's, the Emperor Augustus's trip to be reconciled with his exiled grandson Agrippa, he alludes to a rumor that the emperor was killed by his wife, Livia, um, in order to prevent uh, Agrippa's reinstatement. So all the components of such a tale foreshadowed the murder of Claudius by his wife Agrippina to allow her son Nero to succeed before the emperor reverted to his own son Britannicus. So yeah, Mel Miller goes on to say, look, Tacitus is, con Tacitus is content to use the rumors to besmirch, simply by association, both Livia and Tiberius, who, whatever their failings, never displayed, displayed the deranged malice of an Agrippina or a Nero. Um, it is good literature, but it is irresponsible history. And this is coming from Ronald Meller, one of those Tacitian world's experts and scholars that I was trying to say Tacitus is a great guy, and I was quoting him before um, in that regard. So, okay, well, how do I respond to this then? He, he reports things that he knows are false historically for a literary or moral purpose. So in the first place, there's no reason to think that the reference to Jesus specifically is one of these quote-unquote exceptions would give us that indication, such as there are in the case of Agrippina and Nero and, and Tiberius and that sort of thing in Livia. And I've already noted that Tacitus's scruples and concern for accuracy were such that he always, every exceptionally, exceptionally, shunlessly, indicated when he reported rumors like this, and this proves the point. He calls this a rumor in the text. Um, and he always differentiates rumors from what is actual historical fact. And Tacitus reports the Jesus quotation as a historical fact. He doesn't say this is as is said by the Christians or as is rumored uh, to have occurred. Um, and, ta and Tacitus always, uh, he always differentiates rumor from historical fact. The Jesus passage is historical fact, according to Tacitus. Beyond this, uh, it can also be noted that, look, everything Tacitus reports has a moral context. Um, so applying this criteria would mean that everything in Tacitus's works are, are false. If you want to say, oh, whenever there's a moral context or lesson involved, uh, which is present in the Jesus narrative, there is that moral lesson that... that Tacitus is trying to get across, but that doesn't mean it's it's false because he's got a moral context in everything he writes. Um, so, yeah, that's a false way of doing it, uh, of looking at it. So, yeah, that's how we respond to that objection there. Some uh, radical mythicists or skeptics might still say, but look, it look, it's still possible. I hear everything that you're saying, but it's still possible that Annals 1544 about Jesus is an exception. It, it's unique in all of Tacitus's normal care that you've proven and everyone with a PhD that's a Tacitus scholar agrees with you on, Dale. Um, but, you know, it's it's just, look, the, the thing about Jesus, it's an incidental detail. It fulfills the criterion of uh, disinterest. Uh, it's an off-the-cuff comment about Jesus, whereas main interest is about Nero. So, you know, it, would, it wouldn't really be a strike against Tacitus's general reliability as an ancient historian. Um, according to the standards of ancient historiography, if he just makes one exception for Jesus. Um, so, see, so yeah, I, I think in light of everything we've gone over, this is just ridiculous and can be dismissed as such uh, for the skeptic or the mythicist. They're just desperate trying to dismiss the evidence in any way they can if they say this. Uh, look, it's simply begging the question. You're, you're begging for an exception for the purpose uh, of a decided position supporting mythicism. Uh, despite the fact that we have uh, proven that Tacitus was generally reliable and went into exquisite, an exquisite amount of research uh, to research topics of interest for him, proving that he had at least two reasons why he would have had a special interest to investigate the origins of Christianity and Jesus in particular, it's, yeah, it just seems too convenient. This is just very improbable desperation on the part of skeptics uh, trying to grasp for any straw that they possibly can here. It just, it just sounds ridiculous to go, look, yep, we admit Tacitus normally was accurate, normally checked things out scrupulously. He was the best of all mankind for centuries and millennia. In terms of checking out the details, he had access to everything, but this is just an exception. This is the one exception. 
or about Jesus. Uh, yeah, that's possible, but it's it's extremely improbable. Um, so that that just smacks of ad hoc desperation on the part of skeptics who want to beg the question against the existence of Jesus. So yeah, I, I think uh, that does it for, for this section on Cornelius Tacitus. So look, so far we've proven the text as a whole is not a forgery. Tacitus wrote that. Everyone with a PhD, all Tacitine scholars agree with me and disagree with any mythicists from the 19th and 18th centuries that think otherwise. And it's been scientifically proven through archaeology that those people are wrong. Secondly, the passage in particular, 1544, talking about Jesus, is not a forgery. It's not a later Christian interpolation. Tacitus wrote that, just like he wrote the entire work as a whole. Thirdly, Cornelius Tacitus himself was scrupulous and very reliable, extremely reliable. Um, so we can't say that he was just making things up or didn't exercise due caution um, when he was writing uh, and trying to distinguish rumors from historical facts. And when he said G Jesus died under Pontius Pilate, under the reign of Tiberius, as the founder of the Christians, that was a historical fact. He didn't identify that as a rumor. So he meant for us to go, yep, that happened. Um, but that brings us to the fourth area of investigation. And this is this is really the area that most mythicists today, uh, Richard Carrier, Bob Price, uh, all, all of the... Uh, David Johnson himself. Th this is really where they want to go. Okay, yep, I'll, I'll give you all of that. But Tacitus's sources, uh, what was the reliability of his sources, of where he's getting his information from? So maybe Tacitus was duped um, by an unreliable source of some kind. And typically that, that goes to, he got it from Christians, you know, hearing their testimony or hearing hearsay evidence and he just reported it as though it was historical fact um so again that he would have recorded he would have identified that as mere rumor given that he hates christians so that can be dismissed right away but we won't get into that yet uh we'll talk a little bit more about that but that's just one thing that we've already learned that would make you go i don't believe you um on against the mythicist uh type deal um but yeah let, let's get into this and look at the Tacitus' sources and what their reliability, what, what those would have been and what the reliability of them uh, would have been. Um, so we already know in general Tacitus was extremely scrupulous um, in, in critically evaluating all of his sources before he used them. So in, in general, as I said, Tacitian scholars all agree with me on this, right? Uh, Dr. R Ronald Mendel Tac says that, look, in Tacitus often quotes, uh, he'll quote from three divergent opinions from three different historians on a story involving Nero. He was concerned even about the minor historical details in this regard. Mendel further notes that uh, the Tacitus citation uh, of a fantastic story about one Drusus was based only on a persistent rumor. So again, he's distinguishing rumor from historical fact. Now, in the annals, in the particular, in terms of the work with the paragraph uh, about Jesus in particular, Mendel cites, Dr. Mendel, uh, this Tacitus scholar, cites 30 instances where Tacitus uses specific phrases, quote unquote, to substantiate a statement or to present a statement for which he does not care to vouch. Mendel also notes that in books 11 through 16, remember uh, the Jesus passage is in book 15 of the Annals, Tacitus is specifically, quote unquote, concerning himself with the evidence and source references, even to a greater extent than he does in general in the earlier books. He relies on other historians. He uses a bronze inscription in 1114. He uses reports or memoirs for book 15. That's the same part where Jesus is mentioned. Uh, he uses personal testimonies in book 15. Uh, he cites physical evidence in book 1542, just two uh, chapters before the Jesus passage in 44. There are indications of searches for firsthand in book 1541 and written source evidence, source evidences um, to rely upon in recounting his history and what he reports as historical fact. Yeah, I, I really think that, look, this, this proves that the citation of Jesus uh, comes in the middle of one of Tacitus's most carefully documented works. 
for example, in, in reporting a conspiracy of, of Paizo to assassinate Nero. Tacitus acknowledges the difficulty of accurate knowledge for such conspiracies. Um, he indicates where his knowledge is uncertain and does not use even one of Pliny's, uh, his best buddy Pliny's quotes as positive evidence because he considers it to be wholly absurd. This is in book 1553. Remember I mentioned before that he, he calls his buddy, you're, you're out to lunch. Uh, this is what I was talking about. Um, so yeah, Tacitus was a very careful historian in terms of the sources, what he would trust, and he would, especially in the works where this citation of Jesus is mentioned, he would go out of his way to substantiate a statement as being not one that he is prepared to vouch. That doesn't happen with Jesus. He's wholeheartedly, this is fact. This is not a rumor. Believe this. Um, so that's that's the context that we have here in general. Um, but yeah, what in the first place, what, what sort of sources might uh, Tacitus have had to get his information about Jesus then? We, we can trust that he would have engaged in source criticism and would have been scrupulous in that regard. But who, who would have these sources might have been? Um, so one suggestion that we have in the first place is that maybe Tacitus used his best buddy, Pliny the Younger, or Pliny Secundus, um, and Pliny was an unreliable, secondhand, non-Christian source that Tacitus just blindly believed in this case about the Christian. And on the face of it, uh, this sounds plausible. I mean, uh, Tacitus was best buds. He was BFFs with Pliny the Younger, Pliny Secundus here. You know, they Tacitus sent his works to Pliny for criticism, um, and Tacitus himself even begged for the product, for the quote-unquote product of Pliny's pen on multiple occasions. And he, he even turned to Pliny for first-hand material for his history, for his history's book. So he did use Pliny as a source, and we know this for a fact. So was he just getting his information about the Christians, claims about Jesus uh, from Pliny the Younger, and just blindly believed whatever Pliny told him to believe and just wrote it down based on what Pliny said? Um, no, I don't. This is an improbable suggestion of the skeptic or mythicist. Uh, most mythicists don't believe this is the case. To, um, so, number one, in the first place, Tacitus didn't accept information from Pliny uncritically. He was critical of Pliny. I gave that quote in 1553 where he calls Pliny wholly absurd in the nonsense that he was spouting. And this is his, his best buddy he's calling. Um, so even with Pliny the Younger, someone who he's very friendly with, he, he won't just uncritically, mindlessly believe whatever he tells him to believe. He'll check it and call it out as horse manure if, if he doesn't uh, buy it. Also, we have, in general, Tacitus is a very careful historian, so he would not just uh, trust a report of what the Christians told Pliny. Uh, he would carefully check the material to confirm if what they were telling Pliny was true or not, based on what we know of Tacitus. And then finally, secondly, look, it, it doesn't make sense. Why, uh, Tacitus wouldn't have any need to go to Pliny to hear what the Christians are saying. He had more Christians in his own province of Asia where he was the governor. So he could have gotten this information from the Christians directly. There was no need for him to go, hey, hey, Pliny, what are the Christians telling you over there? What, you know, who's this Christus guy or something like that? He can just go to the Christians and say, and ask them himself if he wanted to do that. So yeah, I think the Pliny option is improbable. That's probably not what happened. And Tacitus had other sources uh, that he would have used to gain information about the Christians. Now here, here comes the main one. This is the one that most mythicists will use in a debate. And they'll, they'll say, yeah, well, look, as you said, Tacitus had access to lots of Christians in his province. So he probably got unreliable information from Christians uh, and just mindlessly wrote down whatever they told him to write down. Yeah, we uh, believe in Christ, Christus, who was uh, in Christ, uh, who was crucified by Pontius Pilate, blah, blah, blah. And he just, oh, okay, and wrote it down. Now, in the first place, what we've learned from Tacitus is that's not true. He wouldn't have done that. He despised Christians. He would not just take what they say as at face value. And he had... He would have identified it as rumor if this was the case, as opposed to historical fact. Um, he would have had occasion and motive to actually check into this because it's about a pretender uh, and the royal family was becoming converted by Christianity at some point. 
um, the Emperor Domitian's niece, uh, Domitella. So, yeah, I, I think it's improbable, especially given the fact that it's so polemical against Christians and that sort of thing. I, I don't think that listening to what Christians themselves had to say was, was his only or even his main source that Tacitus would have uncritically or allowed to go in. There, there would have had to have been more involved for him to state as historical fact their founder Christus was crucified by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius um, and you know his knowledge of the fact that this suppressed the rumor and then it broke out uh, once again outside of Judea. Um, plus there's also the fact that Tacitus was motivated to look into Christianity because he had his own quirky interest in evaluating what he called pretenders. Um, now, as, as a way of a counter, a mythicist named G.A. Wells does provide three reasons as to, you know, he thinks this proves, no, Tacitus did in fact get his information from Christians. So the first one he, he brings up is Tacitus is in error. And this is unlike him, right? So he must have used, uncritically used a, a Christian source of ignorant lay Christians who didn't know what they're talking about. Um, and when he calls Pilate a procurator, in reality, that title didn't exist back in the day. Pilate was what was called a prefect. Um, so this proves Tacitus was, was unreliable here. He must have had an unreliable source who didn't know what they were talking about because that title, procurator, didn't come into effect until the second half of the first century AD. Now, the counter response to this is decisive. This is complete rubbish on the part of skeptics. Uh, no one with any knowledge at all in history believes this anymore. In the first place, uh, this error isn't taken... There are two, way, two ways we can counter this kind of objection. So number one, evidence, historical evidence, actually proves and indicates that there was a certain fluidity in the usage of these terms. And number two, Tacitus may have been anachronizing on purpose, using titles... Uh, of the future so people and imposing that on people of the past so they would know oh, okay he, he was a procurate procurator that's the same as being a prefect back in time or something like that so uh, first going to the first uh, objection here so we need to understand what's the difference between these two titles so a procurator um, as the word implies is, is uh, someone like a financial administrator who acted really as the emperor's personal agent, whereas a prefect was a military official. So, yeah, what, what evidence is there um, that there is this easy interchange um, or fluidity between the usage of these terms? And our uh, scholar here is John Meyer, um, an excellent biblical scholar. Um, and he says, look, quote, that in the quote-unquote backwater province of Judea, there is probably not much difference between the two roles. This assertion is backed up by literary evidence from Philo and Josephus, uh, because they were not consistent in the usage of these terms either. Josephus calls Pilate a procurator in Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, 5 and 6. Um, the story about Pilate bringing images into Jerusalem. It is not, and it's, it's not been suggested, but we may wonder if, if like, uh, the, a backwater country like Judea or province, maybe Pilate even had both titles. Um, so it, it's actually not even a, a, a mix-up based on the fluidity there. So, you know, in practical terms, both procurators and prefix in Judea had the power to execute criminals who were not Roman citizens. So, yeah, practically in this context, that it's a difference that makes no difference. Um, <laughs> you know, same, same, but different type thing. Secondly, also, we have the, the point that Tacitus may have been using these terms like an anachronistic term for his own reason. The first reason is to avoid confusion for his modern listeners, so they would know exactly, oh, okay, same thing, it means the same thing, but you're using the modern terminology. We do that all the time. Instead of calling people a seer, we call them prophets or something like that. The, the Bible itself does this. It's not a problem. Everybody does it. Not an error. And uh, we... we can cite inscriptional evidence that the position held by Pilate was called prefect, but procurator in the years 44 to 66 AD. Yeah, ta basically John Mayer will just say Tacitus is simply using the term that his readers will be most 
familiar with. And we, we know for a fact that Tacitus, it's proven that he does do this. He does use modern terminology. For example, instead of calling the person an emperor, he calls them an imperante. And Tacitus, as a senator, knew, 100% knew full well that was not the proper, proper title for past emperors. So, yeah, that is fully plausible that this is what Tacitus is doing. Now, you may find these uh, explanations or defenses to be unbelievable. Um, okay, well, let me quote your good buddy, your own mythicist hero, Richard Carrier, who agrees 100% with me and not with the skeptic. Um, so Richard Carrier has expressed sympathy for the mythicist position, but now advocate, um, and he has stated with regards to this procurator issue, quote unquote, it seems evident from all the source material available that the post was always a prefecture and also a proctorship, proctorship. So it's, he's going for the both and position. Interesting, he was a prefect and a procurator at the same time. Pilate was almost certainly holding both posts simultaneously, a practice that was likely established from the start when Judea was annexed in 6 AD by the Roman Empire. And since it is more insulting uh, to an elite, an elitist like Tacitus and his readers to be a procurator, and even more insulting to be executed by one, it is likely Tacitus chose that office out of his well-known sense of malicious wit. Uh, remember I said he's got this bias against Jesus, right, and Christians. So he's, he's sticking it to Jesus by saying you were crucified by a procurator, not a prefect, but a procurator. And, and that's a even bigger insult, apparently. Um, Carrier goes on, quote-unquote, Tacitus was also a routine employer of veratio. Um, so deliberately seeking non-standard ways of saying things. And this is one of the several markers of that tac Tacitian style that everyone sees in this um, verse and proves that Tacitus himself actually wrote it, and it's not a Christian interpolation. Uh, finally, Carrier says, so there is nothing unusual about his choice of the word procurator here. Skeptics, utter failure. And every Tacitian scholar, including mythicists like Richard Carrier, agree with me. Um, so, yeah, you just need to educate yourself a little bit better on uh, that objection there. Um, okay, well, here's another objection that G.A. Wells tries to point out and says, well, this proves he got his info from Christians. Tacitus refers to Jesus as Christus or Christ and not by a proper name. Remember David Johnson in the beginning uh, brought that up thinking it, it you know, it was devastating to the, the historicist case or something when it wasn't. Um, so he'll say, um, the, the point here, G.A. Wells will say, well, this probably shows he did not consult official records because he would have had a proper name if that were the case. Well, uh, in terms of this objection, uh, we could respond by saying, look, once again, Tacitus used the language that would be most familiar to his readers, and they would know Jesus as the Christ, as Christ of the Christians, as opposed to having giving his no proper name Jesus Christ or or Christ Jesus, uh, which would be more like if he got his information from Christians and just blindly believed unreliable Christian sources, that's what the lay Christians would have called him. They would have called him the intimate Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, not Christ or Christus. Um, so this proves that he's not getting his information from uh, Christians, um, if anything. Um, but yeah, in, in point of fact, all it shows is, look, that, that's how he would have been known to the ancient pagans and the, the re, who would have been his readers. And he wants to go with the name that's most familiar to that. Furthermore, think about it. Simply referring to Jesus wouldn't explain to his readers, uh, you know, how it is that Jesus' followers were named Christians in the first place, which is what they were known by in, in Rome and during the fire, Neronian persecution. Um, Dr. Rob Van Burst, uh, he further makes the point that Tacitus is actually is issuing a subtle uh, corrective here in this passage. So the, the text of the oldest manuscript we have here, and most, like, most likely reading, spells Christians with an E, Christians, and that'll come into play when we talk about uh, Suetonius. But yeah, in, in naming Christ, Tacitus is actually correcting in a way typical of his you know, his style of economy when he writes. The, the misunderstanding of uh, the crowd, Volgus, by, by stating that the founder of this name is Christus, 
not the common name given by the crowd, Crestus, with an E. Um, so he calls attention uh, to this by his, his somewhat unusual phrase of, of the, the name, uh, you know, from the, the movement, Christians. Uh, and this allows him to link it directly and correctly to the name of Christ that we know today. And this is common practice, as we'll see in a later source, Pliny the Younger also calls him uh, Christus or Christ with an I. Um, so yeah, I think that covers... There is a third, there is a third objection here, a uh, miscellaneous objection that skeptics or mythicists will try to say prove Tacitus or his sources were, you know, unreliable Christians or something like that. And it's Tacitus refers to a quote unquote great multitude of Christians at Rome. And, you know, there this wouldn't have been the case. There wouldn't have been that many Christians in Rome at this early time in 64 AD, which is the time Tacitus refers to. And therefore, this reflects a Christian bias, the, the mythicists will say. You know, there that proves he got his info from lay Christians of the second century and he just blindly believed whatever they said. Um, but this is just an empty objection. It merely assumes, you know, it's begging the question on the part of mythicists. They just want to desperate not to believe no matter what. Um, and it's vague. What, what is a great multitude? What does that mean? Is that 50? Is it 100? 5,000? Um, you know, it's a relative term for um, to use to, to try and make this argument, and it just fails utterly. Yeah, uh, so it lacks specificity. This, this argument is just garbage. It doesn't prove anything. Okay, so so great. So if it isn't, it's probably not lay Christians, or at the very least, not just lay Christians that Tacitus is getting his information from. It's probably not Pliny the Younger, or Pliny Secundus. Um, well, who is it? Okay, well then, who was it? Who were these other sources then, perhaps, be? Where does Tacitus get his his information where he's being a critical historian about Jesus from? Uh, and the simple answer is, well, look, it, there is no way to really tell. He, ancient historians generally don't feel an obligation to reveal their sources. Um, Tacitine scholar Dr. Dr. Dudley uh, says this, quote unquote, an ancient historian was under no obligation to give his sources in detail, nor even to mention them at all. You know, systematic, careful references are a modern invention. Yeah, they're, they're in the first place, there there is that. Um, however, it's we can make uh, arguments that about where Tacitus, pro Tacitus probably got his information from, and we know for a fact he probably got his information from the work of other historians whom he trusted and whose work is now lost to us. You know, in the book in fifteen book fifteen thirty eight, which is just right before fifteen forty four, where it talks about Jesus, Tacitus, for example, refers to quote unquote multiple authors, meaning historians. Who have given account. His information may have also come from common knowledge uh, on the, the street. Oral tradition by that period had spread far enough that he there was no countervailing evidence that there was no Jesus or there wasn't any Christians going around saying Jesus is a myth, Jesus is a myth, which we would expect. That's, that's an argument. Another argument we'll get into that proves mythicism is totally false. Uh, we would have Jesus mythers going around and Tacitus would have known about them and talked about them if that was the case. Some suggestions ha have also been made that Tacitus may have got his information from Josephus, but to be honest this is just garbage. It it's rejected by all Tacitian scholars. Um, Dr. Dr. Mendel that I mentioned before, for example, he he'll say that Tacitus clearly knew nothing about Josephus based on what he's written. It's just totally opposite and, and there's just so much evidence that proves he, he he didn't know anything about Josephus. He didn't use Josephus as a source. So, okay, um, so common knowledge, other historians that are now lost to us. And what other Christian apologists like to argue for is, well, he the imperial archives. This is the best source um, that proves it. And okay, maybe he used the imperial archives for some of this information. And I'm gonna argue that he probably did. Um, but there is an objection based on this, and, and they'll say he probably didn't use imperial archives. You know, we kind of covered that, you know, in terms of the procurator or um, using the name G uh, Christus instead of Jesus, the proper title versus the proper name. But yeah, the, the main objection, I would say, look, they'll say Tacitus would not have had permission to consult the imperial archives. And even if he did, 
it was not his regular practice to consult written documents. So this is the, what the Mithers try to say to try and prove he couldn't have gotten the information from Imperial Archive. Uh, even, even evangelical scholars like Murray Harris sort of support this, and they say, look, the, these Imperial records were quote-unquote secret so that even the Roman Senate needed special permission to consult them. Yeah, it's, it's not just like you can just walk in and, and get access to the imperial archives whenever you want. You need special permission from the emperor. Even Roman senators were not allowed uh, to just walk in and, and check out the records for their own purposes. So, yeah, what, does this eliminate the possibility that Tacitus used imperial archives? Not at all. This is This is just ridiculous because in the first place Tacitus was in such a position he was close with the emperors uh, Trajan and that sort of thing so he he would have had uh, permission as a scholar and historian to have access to the imperial archives it's more probable than not that he did as opposed to senators um, who were political rivals for the emperor and that sort of thing in, in a way so yes the imperial archives were indeed jealously guarded um, but Tacitus, for example, in histories, we know that the emperors did grant permission regularly to consult the imperial archives. And Tacitus himself was, in fact, given permission uh, for research um, in his histories, for example. Yeah, there, you know, there's nothing from Tacitus' own works that tell us about whether Tacitus himself needed special permission to consult the imperial archives um, or if because he was so well known in the empire, the emperor, and if a favorite of the emperor, he was granted permission whenever he wanted um, as the official historian of the Roman Empire. Now, looking at Tacitus's background, this would suggest that basically if anyone were able to get special permission to consult the imperial archives, Tacitus is the guy. This is, this is the guy it would go to. He had singularly had the qualifications and preference from the empire, uh, and he was well-respected, uh, world-renowned to everyone in the empire. So, yeah, he, he was someone considered of high quality um, and had great fame as an orator. Um, but, yeah, be, beyond that, uh, we can also report that there is actual evidence that Tacitus consulted original doc documents generally and governmental records specifically we actually have proof positive that he did access the imperial records, as I said. Um, so, for example, he consulted original documents of speeches of the emperor, which are discussed in his annals, letters sent to Tiberius and others attacking Nero and Agrippina. He, he has the Acta Senatus, included letters from emperors, governors of provinces like Pilate. Um, Tacitus also probably made use of Rome's public libraries. He also consulted the Acta de Journa, which is basically like the daily public gazette, the newspaper. Um, he, he consulted private journals and memoirs, which uh, preserved in large numbers, especially the older aristocratic families. That Tacitus consulted the Senate archives is proved by the character of the material by its distribution. Relative to Book 4, Meller says that Tacitus used the records of the Senate for detailed accounts of speeches and debates. He included archival research, uh, which is especially notable in the early books of the Annals. Tacitus used the works of previous historians in private records, the Acta Senatus and Acta de Journa. So yeah, I, I think it's m much more probable than not that Tacitus had access to the imperial and senate archives which included the acts of pontius pilate and letters from the governors which would have included his information of jesus so i think it's m much more probable than not that tacitus had credible official records uh for the death of jesus by pontius pilate that he was basing his uh, assertion that this is historical fact on okay so all in all summarizing the evidence from cornelius tacitus uh, I think this evidence is successful. On a balance of probabilities, it proves it's more probable than not that the minimal historical Jesus Christ, or Jesus, uh, did in fact exist, as per the evidence from Tacitus. So it's not a failure like Thallus and Flagan. And the way I arrived at this, so I assigned my own normative probabilities to each of the aspects with Tacitus. So in the first place, what's the probability that Tacitus as a whole is not a textual forgery by a Christian or a pagan or something like that. The whole work is just a forgery 
as we saw, no one agrees with that. It's laughed at today. Tacitian scholars will laugh in your face if you even dare hint that such a thing is possible. Um, so I gave that, I think it's 95% to, nine. it's proven beyond reasonable doubt, 95% to 99.99% proven that Tacitus's works as a whole were written by Cornelius Tacitus, the Roman historian. And I'll go with the worst case scenario for the benefit of you skeptics and mythicists. So let's say 95% proven. The second aspect, okay, well, given that Tacitus did write the annals in general, did he write that particular passage talking about Jesus, 1544 in the annals, uh, book 15, chapter 44, or is that a later Christian interpolation? And I think it's rather, once again, all the Tacitian scholars conclude with me. The, the evidence is too strong from the style and, and uh, the other evidence that this passage does in fact belong in the original and it was therefore written by Tacitus. So uh, I give the Christian interpolation of this specific passage within the text as a whole, nine, again, 95 to 99.99% proven and I'm a bit stronger. So I'm going to give it in the middle, 97.5% proven that this specific passage is not a Christian interpolation, but in fact was written uh, by Tacitus about Jesus. Then the third element about Cornelius Tacitus and his, okay, given that he wrote it, uh, is he reliable in general? Um, and, you know, would he have, uh, was he being reliable in this particular passage? And, you know, we got into the evidence about how he had motivation to actually look into it. He, he was in a position to be scrupulous. He, uh, especially in these later books uh, of the annals, he was trying to be much more meticulous. He always differentiated between rumor and, and hearsay and that sort of thing. And he states categorically, this is historical fact. There's no mention or indication this is a, a rumor, or just hearsay of what Christians supposedly say about their leader and that sort of thing. So I'm 85% certain that given Tacitus wrote this passage, yeah, th this is... He is reporting historical facts as he knows it as a generally reliable historian and he was motivated to check out uh, sources to find out that this is true um, so he he thought that this was this actually happened um, I'm 85 percent convinced of that and then the final element what about Tacitus's sources were they reliable and I would say I'm 75 percent convinced that Tacitus use sources, not just lay Christians, not just Pliny the Younger and, and just blindly believed it, but he actually did critical analysis using other historians that are now lost to us that he trusted and also checked actual records and letters because we know for a fact he did. Uh, I, I mentioned the list there that the letters from the Senate to the governors, including Pilate, um, that we know for a fact he checked. Um, he would have probably had access to the imperial archives as well, not just the Senate's archives. We know that he checked out letters and memoirs and this sort of thing. And given his motivation to care about Jesus and the origin of Christianity because of the imperial family converting to Christianity with the Flavian, the Domitian of the Flavian dynasty, um, and his, his caring about pretenders who pretend to raise from the dead specifically, uh, yeah, I would say I'm 75% convinced that Tacitus's sources were credible official records, or at least included them uh, as confirmation of the core facts that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. Um, so, so yeah, multiply those four elements, 95% times 97.5% times 85% times 75%, and we come out to 59.05% proven that the Tacitus quote proves a minimal historical Jesus existed uh, and was put to death under Pontius Pilate's orders in the reign of Tiberius. Uh, and he was known as the Christus, the Messiah, the founder of the Christian movement from which they get their name. Uh, the superstition, as he calls it, was abated for a bit and then broke out all over the world, just like what Acts tells us, including in the imperial city of Rome by 64 AD uh, up until Tacitus's time in 115-117 AD. Um, so yeah, 59.05%, close to 60% overall that this this quote proves it. It's, it's successful. It's more probable than not, given this evidence in isolation, that a minimal historical Jesus did in fact exist. 
great. Uh, our first success. Um, okay, so so that's it for Tacitus.